the best book of 2009 in the Washington Post and many other newspapers throughout the country. And it uh, more recently won the Christopher Award in 2010. Uh, the award salutes books that affirm the highest values of the human spirit. Uh, Dr. White is also the author, as most of you know, of the Lincoln's Greatest Speech, the second inaugural, published in 2002, uh, honored by the New York Times, a notable book for that year, and more recently, The Eloquent President, a portrait of Lincoln through his words in 2005, which was a selection of the History Book Club and the uh, Book of the Month Club. Dr. White's a graduate of both uh, UCLA and Princeton Theological Seminary. He holds a PhD in religion and history from Princeton University. He's taught at UCLA, Princeton Theological Cemetery, Seminary. Easy for you to say. All right. Uh, Whitworth University, Colorado College, and San Francisco Theological Seminary. And it's Current work, he is working on a biography, a biography of Mrs. S. Grant, that will be published by Random House. I give you our award recipient for 2011, Dr. Ronald C. White. If I stand here, can you hear me? Yes. 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 I want to get our distinguished introducer off the hook here. Uh, in 2002, I was invited to be interviewed on the then Jim Lehrer News Hour, and uh, as who, uh, Ray Suarez did the interview, and as we began the interview, he introduced me as Princeton Theological Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, in that setting, we said, "Well, let's cut one. Let's do the cut two. <laughs> so we were able to. It's a common mistake. <laughs> uh, I want to introduce some dear friends who have come this evening. Uh, Bruce and Jenny McClory are lovely friends of mine for some years here. Kathy Farnick and Jen Scott also. Thank you all four for coming. Thank you. Uh, I want to entitle my remarks tonight, Abraham Lincoln 2011, Wisdom for Today. Be careful what you hear at the table. It's like Lincoln hears at the, at the hotel in debate number four in Charleston, this man asks him a question and suddenly that becomes the topic of the debate, but I'm going to seize that opportunity and note the recent survey of people, what are the causes of the Civil War? <laughs> the causes of the Civil War are number one, states' rights, and number two, slavery, and of course this the gentleman to my right said that the state's rights were so that we could enact slavery. Right. <laughs> but more disturbing than that was that it, when you looked at the ages of the people who answered the question, it was younger people who thought it was state's rights, not older people who did not understand the meaning of the Civil War. I take a special delight. I'm preaching to the choir, I think, here tonight. <laughs> It's like I was in Galena last weekend for my first meeting of the U.S. Grant Association. And you've all had this experience. We were going through various places, including the, the house that the citizens of Galena gave to U.S. Grant after he had been the great general of the Civil War. And so our tour guide begins telling members of the U.S. Grant Association, now U.S. Grant was born in Point Pleasant, Ohio. He grew up and then suddenly said, I think you know this. <laughs> and I tried to ask a question of one of the tour guides, and I realized that I'd really thrown her off, and it just she had her spiel. I'm not taking away from many of you probably served her those spiel. She had her spiel, and she didn't want me to throw her off by asking a curveball question. I take a special delight in trying to speak, as it were, to non Lincoln round tables. I'm so convinced that students, for example, need to know more of Lincoln. Every year I accept an invitation from the Gilder Lehrman Institute. This summer I will be doing an institute at the University of Kentucky in Lexington for fifth, eighth, and 11th grade teachers on Lincoln and the Civil War. Uh, I've done this in other states because 
you would be amazed and disturbed at how Lincoln is not being taught in our American history classes in this nation. Gilbert Lehrman, of course, is committed to the fact that history is not being taught and that we need to teach more history. So I'm really delighted to be with you today. I like to say to people that, and you would appreciate this, that when I say Abraham Lincoln wisdom for today, I want to speak as a historian, I want to speak as a biographer, but I really want to speak about why he still does speak to us today. I don't know that there's any Thomas Jefferson groups in D.C. or a George Washington group of D.C. or a Franklin Delano Roosevelt group of D.C. or a Theodore Roosevelt. It's not to say that those persons aren't important. They're all important. But I believe that somehow Lincoln's words still speak to us today and will speak in 2061 and 2111. So that even though we want to understand him in his historical context, his words in a distinctive way speak today. When the people of New York struggled to find, discover how could they remember 9-11 at the first anniversary, they looked around for a poet or a politician who could give voice to their deepest feelings. In the end, they said the Gettysburg Address together. That was the best word they could speak. So I've given you a handout tonight, if you will take it from your table. What I'd like to do is open up just a few windows on Lincoln. There's so many windows that we could open, and the Bicentennial, in a wonderful way, opened these. When I wrote my biography, I discovered that I had to give much more space to topics that I hadn't originally conceived. I, I don't write it where I have this massive outline in advance. I, I can't do it that way. I, kind of discover as I move along. So for example, I, I wanted to take advantage of the great strides we've made in learning about Lincoln the lawyer. Uh, in 1988 or so, the effort was made through then Sangamon State College, now the University of Illinois at Springfield, to send a group of master's students out to all the 102 county courthouses of Illinois to see if there were any Lincoln legal documents still in existence. What these master students found were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Lincoln legal papers invariably rolled up. Most had turned blue. And almost always, his name had been razor plated out in the 19th century. The Huntington Library, where I do my work, put on a Lincoln exhibit, and our curator did it in a sense by saying Lincoln was the first rock star, and the first rock star was people wanted autographs. I have still, I remember, I, I've spoken, I was speaking at the Philadelphia Free Library a couple of years ago, and an older woman came up to me and she said, I don't want you to sign my book, here's my autograph book. Would you sign my autograph book? And if you look at the Lincoln papers, you'll see how many letters Lincoln received. Could you send an autograph for my son, for my daughter? So these Lincoln legal documents opened up a whole new vista of Lincoln the lawyer. Ah, but there was a problem. As I was doing my biography, my, are there any lawyers in the crowd here tonight? <laughs> <laughs>